Good afternoon and welcome to all of you to Fundación Telefónica and to those of you who are following us via streaming. Today is a very special day for us. We are presenting an exhibition that we've developed together with the CCB and the Welcome Collection. We've brought it to Madrid and we think it's going to be very interesting for the public. I would like to thank John Subirat, the Minister for Universities, the Minister for Science and Innovation, who will join us shortly. She had a previous event and she will be here very soon. The curator, Emily Sargent, and Ricard Solé, the other uh, curator of the exhibition who has not been able to attend this event, but thank you for his work. Judith Carrera, director of the CCCB, um, Joan Font Cubera and Mavi Sanchez Vives. One of the identity marks of Telefónica is the cross-cutting approach to culture and knowledge in a world where we try to have a hybrid approach. We combine technology, science, humanities with a special focus on the impact of technology with regard to current society. We try to establish associations, different different uh, disciplines, not in a siloed manner, but in a related manner, so that we understand better the complexity of uh, nowadays world that is hyper-connected uh, with this global vision. Connection for us is a key word. It defines cerebros and it defines telefonica. We look for these connections. First of all, this exhibition is born uh, thanks to the collaboration uh, with two strong institutions that have the same approach. The Welcome Collection and the CCTB have a wide activity. They relate science, technology, medicine, art to be able to understand the different concepts and approaches to reality. Another important connection for us has to do with the uh, celebration of the research year of Ramón y Cajal, boosted by the government in 2022. And this exhibition is part of the official program to be able to commemorate this uh, legacy of one of the most uh, important Spanish scientists. And I would like to thank the ministry, the minister and the team for their collaboration and the possibility for us to uh, join this celebration. I also wanted to mention Ima Aguilar, the director of the Foundation for Science and Technology here in Spain, who has supported us to be able to broaden the educational program in relation to uh, Cerebros, and it has been very uh, interesting. Cerebros uh, opens up many questions uh, with regard to consciousness, uh, creativity, what is happening within uh, ill mind, and maybe thinking, will machines be able to think as human beings? Many questions are posed. Some are answered, others are not. They remain as uh, open questions, but uh, with these rational and scientific approaches through the emotional experience, we try to tackle these issues. These issues are very interesting for the majority of us. This exhibition was open to the public on December 23rd. It hasn't been very visible up to now. We've had Christmas. Today is the official opening and we've received more than 20,000 visits and there's a long queue and this hadn't happened for quite some time. Uh, well, face to face exhibition due to the pandemic, of course, but we can see that the exhibition is very well conceived and we would like to thank and congratulate our curators for their work and the team of Fundación Telefónica, uh, Mr. Uh, Gonzalo Brancos, uh, thank you for bringing uh, this exhibition here to this uh, space and with their passion and their hard work. Uh, thank you for their collaboration and thank you for being here to everybody. Thanks. <coughs> Thank you.
Bueno, pues. Well, thanks a lot, everyone. Thanks, Carmen. And thanks, everyone, for being here. I wanted to summarize the activities that will be carrying out throughout this exhibition before continuing with the agenda of the event. And as Carmen has said, this exhibition shows this approach that we have of combining different disciplines because we firmly believe that there are no limits to knowledge and there should be no borders to knowledge. But it also shows clearly another thing that we believe in our foundation and a goal of what we do, which is this idea of disseminating knowledge to achieve a more a fair society and a more inclusive society, a society that includes everyone in knowledge and culture. Our goal with this action is to inspire the young. We have many programs that focus on education, but also with the rest of activities of the foundation, we believe it is also important to inspire them and to take them closer to humanity, science and technology in a different way, in a motivating way. The goal is probably that in the future we will have many more Nobel Prize winners among our young people that will continue this legacy of Ramon y Cajal and of other scientists. This exhibition is in the framework of other activities that are in line with the same goal. To give you an idea, over the last months we have worked in projects where we have uh, discussed the history of technology development in Spain and Latin America with the exhibition we had here under the title Conexiones, Connections. We have also discussed the and explore the challenges of digital transition uh, in relation with ecology in an exhibition devoted to Yang Yang. We have generated also debates, very important debates on the future of work in the digital society with our magazine Telos. And for the next months, we are launching and we will launch projects that will focus on issues as important as fake news or the challenge of the, mm, the creation of the metaverse and this hybridation between the physical world and the virtual world. I also wanted to say that, as Carmen has said, the educational program of this exhibition is really important, really relevant and extensive. It is a program where we have worked with the unit of culture of the Cajal Institute with the Spanish Society of Neuroscience and with many Spanish universities and international universities. We will have and we are having because we have already opened this exhibition, we have workshops and talks on the evolution of the human brain and the effect of technology on our brain on mental health, which I think it's a very relevant topic, and also some sessions that you must see with titles like Flies Also Have a Brain, or Honey, Where Did I Leave Einstein's, Einstein's Brain? I'm just telling you the titles to tease you because I think the contents are very interesting. We also have a program of uh, talks where we will have neurologists, scientists, researchers focusing on the brain, like Boris Sirulnik, Stalislav Nehane, Mariano Sigman, or thanks to the collaboration with one of the most important universities at international level, like the UNAM in Mexico, we will have here scientists like Jorge Larribasat, Sarrael Alcautier, or Teresa Morales. Also, uh, following with this idea of uh, hybridation, I will mention 
uh, our collaboration with the Brain Film Fest in March, and also our collab with the cycle Madre Esfera that we have done for several years now that focuses specifically on dissemination for families. As you can see, we have an extensive program of activities and you are all invited to enjoy this program and the exhibition. And I'd like to end by thanking, first of all, our partners, the production of this exhibition, the CCCB and the Welcome Collection, also the curators, and also all these institutions and collaborators that have helped us to bring this project forward. So I leave you with the rest of the event that I believe is going to be really interesting. And I think it will motivate you to the later visit the exhibition. Now I will we'll have a talk by Emily Sargent, one of the curators of the exhibition, that will have a talk with Judith Carrera. And then we'll have also another conversation moderated by Maria Brancos, our uh, exhibition manager with Mavi Sanchez and Joan von Cuberta. And then we'll have a closing by the Ministry of Science and Innovation, Jan Moran. Well, thanks a lot for being here. Thank you very much, Pablo. Carmen, uh, Mr. John Subirat, uh, Minister for Universities. Thank you to the team of Fundación Telefónica, led by Maria Brancos, who have made this uh, collaboration possible, this fascinating journey towards uh, this organ. It's been an incredible uh, journey. We were very successful in Barcelona. And we had these two first uh, small exhibitions in 2012-2016 by the Welcome Collection. Based on these two, we developed new sections in Barcelona and here in Madrid with the collaboration and curation of Emily Sargent and Ricard Sole. Why the brain? The brain is probably the main organ in our body, but it is also the one that defines us as humans, is where creativity, imagination, memory, language are born. And for this reason, we thought it was one of the most fertile ground for the intersection between science and humanities, one of the main uh, basis uh, for the collaboration between the CCB, the uh, Telefonica Foundation and the Welcome Collection in a world that is dominated by artificial intellig uh, intelligence uh, with uh, this future of potential cybergs, we thought that we could bring forward some of the challenges that have to do with this field and opening up the discussion to the world of art and humanities. With this project, the three institutions have wanted to um, pay tribute to Ramón y Cajal, one of the most important Spanish scientists of our history in this uh, year. That is a special celebration of uh, this scientist, taking into account that he was not only the discoverer of uh, neurons, but also he understood how the brain worked, understood as a network of neurons, the uh, what he called the connectome. We are here with uh, Emily Sargent. I'm now going to switch to English so that uh, the conversation with her is more fluent. She is the director of exhibitions of the Welcome collection as it is one of the main institutions in Europe with regard to scientific dissemination and the exploration between art and science and it is an international reference uh, that we always turn to and it is an been a great privilege and honor to work with them coming and thanks for being an inspiration for for this project 
Um, my first question was about why brains uh, and, and what were the aims that, that you started um, uh, this project in, uh, already 10 years ago in 2012? Thank you, Judith, and it's really wonderful to be here, to be at Telefonica and to be with our partners from CCCB. It's been such a privilege to work with um, uh, these organisations. The exhibitions started life, um, as you say, 10 years ago with the first um, iteration which really focused on the brain as a as a, um, a, an object of study, so a sort of, a, of removed from the skull an objectified object and, 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 the, and the ways in which we have all been interested in building our knowledge and understanding of this most complex and enigmatic organ, something that didn't offer us many clues for a long time and yet one in which we all rely. Um, later, we then expanded that into an exhibition that focused on conscious experience, something that was and continues to be a real frontier of, of research and inquiry. It's something that has this really special combination of um, being at the beginning, really, still, of being able to define it in scientific terms. It feels like a really live area of research and development. But also, it's something that we're all really familiar with, in the sense that we bring our own experience with us to the gallery. We all have that sense of self or that, hopefully, level of conscious awareness. Um, and so we're participating in, in it, as well as experiencing and, and starting to unpick the understanding of it. And so that combination of objective study and subjective experience, which characterises the study, really, of brains and, their, and, the, and the experiences that arise from them, that made it such a fascinating subject to both work on those exhibitions all those years ago, but also such a rewarding and exciting proposition to start to develop them, to recognise that 10 years in neuroscience is about 100 years mm. um, in any other study, that we have continued to push forward in those um, kind of that, that sense of a pioneering spirit of inquiry. But that also we can look back. The exhibition here starts 32,000 years ago with the, with the cave paintings and, and looks into the future, but it still doesn't have all its questions answered. So I think that combination of continued inquiry, personal investment, experience, and this sense of knowledge is a really, um, just a, a, a really fascinating combination. This exhibition is, is born out of two exhibitions that you did at, at the Wellcome Collection, one on mm -hmm. brains and one on minds. Mm -hmm. um, no, at that time, you, you still decided to do those, those subjects in a, in a separate uh, way. Mm -hmm. uh, in this exhibition, you and Ricard decided not only to merge those two topics, but also expand it to a, to a third one. Mm -hmm. Could you please maybe in, introduce that yeah, to our in audience? It, and, in it, and as I say, it felt so important that this was an opportunity to develop and expand and um, begin to recognise a, a lot of the work actually that Ricard has been so involved in developing, um, which was really in its infancy when we were, were working on, on, the, on the exhibition in London. So we worked with um, uh, a neuroscientist called Anil Seth, who is um, a very interesting um, uh, researcher. And we were, we were beginning to see these conversations around networks and connectivity in the conversation of consciousness and what Ricard's work does and what he's brought to that the exhibition is to expand it once more out of the human body into the natural world to see how we can recognize those connections those networks that characterize our brain activity uh, external to our own experience our own skull our own individual um, sense and, and into the wider world um, and increasingly also in, in technology. Um, so that sense in which we are surrounded by these uh, ever increasingly complex net networks. How can we relate what we understand about our own experience to these structures and what actually can they teach us about ours? I think, you know, when we were, were starting these conversations, I remember somebody saying, well, if if networks are so important, is my iPhone conscious? And that's a crude question, but those, those inquiries have developed 
exponentially in the time since we were um, developing our exhibition. So it's just wonderful to be able to give um, the the opportunity, yes, yeah, to, to let it develop and expand. And at, at the welcome, you you did this these exhibitions on on brains and 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 minds and consciousness on difficult difficult challenging uh, topics, let's say. But you also open up other topics that are uh, very interesting for general audiences uh, on, on games, milk, no? you have this amazing capaci capacity of opening up yeah. uh, topics for, for public discussion. What is your method, I mean, uh, what is your recipe for bringing together um, art, science, the humanities? What is, what is uh, the recipe for, for the success of your project? Yeah, so for anyone who's not aware of, of Welcome Collection, we're a museum and library in London. We're founded on collections made by an American pharmacist who um, very much a product of his era. He died in the 30s, but, but had a broad interest in what he described as the art and science of healing. And that is really the beginning point for us in thinking about how we might unpack sometimes complex, sometimes difficult um, subjects that are relevant to all of us, um, but that have many different ways of, of coming at it, really. So we might work with artists who themselves are working in a really deeply embedded way with researchers and patient voices. But we might also see how science has shaped popular culture, material culture, as well as working with research scientists and, and, and those raw materials. And I think Again, why brains and consciousness are so uh, rich for us is that we are able to keep those inquiries somewhat open. So we're not necessarily giving a, a sort of sense of a closed book. We're not saying this is what you need to know and it's, it's all here or this is how you should behave, but inviting audiences to come on a journey with us to be part of that inquiry. And I think that produces a kind of liveliness in the experience, which um, also offers all these different entry points, you know, thinking about that access to knowledge. Um, if you come because you're interested in this aspect of cultural history, or you come because you're interested in the pioneering health research, or you come because you're an artist whose practice you follow, uh, is, is in included, but you might then branch off into these other directions which might offer a different approach or a different way of thinking about something that touches all of us. And, and, and talking about um, this, this exhibition, that the third uh, section of this exhibition talks about other intelligence, no? the other minds, mm -hmm. um, talking about not only about artificial intelligence, but also non-human uh, intelligence. Mm -hmm. After the Curating this uh, ambitious project, uh, what would you say that is that human singularity? Is it is it memory? Is it language? Is it this capacity of combining uh, traveling in time, the kind of the, uh, being able uh, to reflect upon our past, but also on projecting ourselves into the future? Is that what really defines humans, and that still machines seem not to be able to do? I mean. It, 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 Definitions are somewhat of a fool's game in this subject, I think, but it is an, a, an, an absolutely fascinating and um, important part of the conscious experience that shapes our understanding of who we are, where we've been, but also where we might go. Uh, and there's a project in the exhibition that was um, developed partly with uh, Welcome um, by artist Shona Illingworth, in which she spent several years working with a, a, a woman who, following a, a, a viral infection, developed a very serious brain lesion, which left her with very significant amnesia. And she was a, an extremely articulate um, subject of, of study in the sense that she was so interested in her own condition, working very closely with Shona and with her neuropsychologist and neurologist um, to really investigate her experience, but also to try and build um, a way of managing in the world. Because if you don't have memory, there are the obvious um, obstacles. She couldn't recognize her children, her family, her husband even. 
um, she would have to navigate the memories that people expected her to hold. There's also this expectation that we know how to behave, who we are, what your relationship is with someone that you can't remember. But also her very clearly articulating that memory is, is absolutely necessary for us to imagine a future. How can we anticipate what might happen or imagine what we might like if we can't understand what has come before? So that really felt, that project really, for me, articulates that peculiar magic of, of human consciousness, that sense of, mm -hmm. of, of the trajectory of time and our ability to travel within it. Maybe my last question would be um, about Ramon y Cajal. Ramon y Cajal is a, is a, a dear <laughs> scientist to, for, for Spain, but I would like to, to know, I mean, how is, it, how is he perceived uh, from London? I mean, uh, how is he, uh, his relevance perceived from, from an international perspective? Yeah, and in both exhibitions, both in 2012 and 2016, Cajal's drawings played a really significant role in articulating the... The, that kind of pivotal position um, that he holds in the history of understanding of the anatomy of the brain, but also the, the nature of how it, how it works. Um, it was a huge privilege for me to travel to Madrid and to see the incredible collections that are held here and to, to display them in London. They are articulate, eloquent, moving, beautiful. They generated a huge amount of excitement uh, initially with the neuroscientists that we were working with. Um, I remember at the opening, the whole cloud of them uh, gathered around. But also people, visitors would come especially to see them. And that recognition of um, their relevance in terms of understanding, but also that, that those kind of traces of, of an individual Right, the drawings, the mark making, the delicacy, the fragility, but also um, the significance of those strokes. I think was um, was not lost on on us, mm. and it was such a yeah such a privilege to be able to show them. And it's wonderful now to be revisiting that um, position here in 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 the heart of the the very heart of the exhibition. For those of you that haven't seen it, there's a real kind of central space. That, that really articulates that, that special place that he holds both in the history of, of um, Spanish science but also in the history of neuroscience more generally. Okay, thank you very much, Emily. It's been a pleasure to discuss with you and we look forward to the, to the visit after, after this session. We will now give the floor to uh, Maria and to Joan Foncoberta and Mavi Sánchez. Muchísimas gracias también a los dos por, por acompañarnos hasta aquí. Gracias. Thank you. Thank you for being with us. Thank you to Joan and Mavi uh, for being here today. It's a great privilege to have you both here prominent figures in your disciplines uh, with your projects too. I don't think we need to introduce you. Uh, I think all of us present here know you uh, very well, but just a brief uh, summary of their careers. Mavi is the representative of the scientific discipline. She has a degree in medicine, a PhD in neuroscience. She's a member of the Human Brain Project uh, Board. She's uh, also a research professor at ICREA. And Joan is one of the most important visual artists of our country. He's received many important awards in visual arts. Uh, he's also received the National Award of Photography. He's a teacher, essayist, uh, writer, uh, etc. And, and he, they both represent this dialogue that we've mentioned uh, from uh, Fundación Telefónica that is also brought forward by the CCTB and the Welcome Collection. We all have a cross-cutting 
approach to culture, this third culture that uh, was uh, created in the 60s but uh, opens us opens up a dialogue between humanities science uh, to be able to tackle complex matters from uh, different points of view they will be presenting uh, the projects that you can see upstairs on the fourth floor and if we have time we will have a small conversation in their projects. This is very interesting to see. We can see certain synergies of uh, ideas, vectors, uh, image as something that is very important uh, from different approaches. In the case of Mavi, the plasticity of brains to make their own uh, virtual uh, bodies and uh, from John's uh, point of view the image is uh, an absolute truth uh, technology the use of uh, virtual reality tools with uh, the use of uh, some uh, materials such as graphene and in the case of John photography as the product of uh, social and technological context that is very specific and how currently in the arts other technologies that I'm sure he will be mentioning such as AI that are now shaping the world of art so uh, well uh, Mavi you have the floor thank you very much I am delighted to be here I'm a neuroscientist. It is a pleasure for me to participate at the opening of this exhibition on brains and also as a fan of Ramon y Cajal. I'm going to be talking about a project that has been included in the exhibition. It is a robot, Robo Cespian we have used engineered arts we didn't ma manufacture it ourselves and i want to explain the uh, relationship with our research with the research on brains i have a neuroscience group of research and the systems uh, brain research we analyze the cortex uh, What's the relationship between all this and the robot? This robot, the study is linked to a technology that we've been using for 18 years to study brains, virtual reality. Virtual reality, the area in which we have focused within our group, is the embodiment area. A virtual body uh, representation in the brain. The question is, how can we feel that a virtual body is part of our body, is part of ourselves? I'm going to show you an example. Here you can see on screen, on the left, a person that is moving. We can do this, uh, there's a monitoring system with sensors, it can be an optic system too. This is used to control a virtual body. First of all, we can see that this virtual body is uh, approached from the first person perspective. Uh, our brain understands that this body belongs to us. We also have moto visual correlations that are sending these signs to the brain. This moto sign is sent to the brain and this is the visual information that I'm receiving. The body is movement, moving and at the same time there's a virtual mirror that um, reflects the image. 
All these correlations send an important information to the brain. This is your body. This creates an illusion of belonging, uh, the embodiment uh, illusion. And it has certain consequences that we've been studying for quite some time. We know that it is stronger than the appearance of this body. We can create our own avatar with our own image, uh, scanning our body, but it wouldn't be necessary. If it is different uh, visually, a different uh, gender, different age, a different race, even if this occurs, the illusion persists and it is perceived as our own body. This has many consequences, many applications. We've um, just mentioned the metaverse. What we learn in this environment is very important with regard to the consequences in the metaverse. We have clinical applications for the treatment of pain, rehabilitation, but the applications of these technologies are very uh, wide. How do we use this robot? with the same principles that we have to feel our own body. We apply them to the robot. It doesn't matter if it's a robot uh, body or a virtual body. We start out with uh, virtual reality studies that, uh, well, uh, don't have the mechanical difficulties associated to robots. Why did we create this robot? We did this uh, within the Beaming uh, project, uh, the Beam Me Up project, so that we were beamed, transported to another place. In Star Trek, it is a molecular decomposition. What we did is see how we could be feeling the body of a robot that is remote. Um, and how to see through his eyes, to hear through his ears, how to talk through the robot, and with all of this, how to see with the same motor control of the robot, we could be beamed to a different place. On this slide, you can see there's a suit. I'm wearing a suit with a monitoring of the movements with different movements. On the right hand side we have the information via the cameras, uh, the eyes of the robot. I was in Barcelona, the robot was in London and I could see uh, through his eyes and this vision and I could interact and this is very important because it has to do with being in the body of a robot. It is different to video conferences. We can see, we can talk to people who are in different parts of the world, but it's very different to have a body there. You can interact on the objects that are there. You can interact with the people. But for me, in the first person, my experience, it was interesting to see how people responded to me. People follow you with the gaze they nod, there's a real interaction. And this is something that we're going to be able to see in a short clip in the following slide. It is an interview with somebody from the BBC. The question is, yes, I can see my hands. I turn around, I can see around me. It is different than seeing it through a camera. But the strongest feeling is to see how people interact physically with nonverbal communication. It is a way of being transported to a different place and interacting in that other place. And of course, It uh, leads to many questions. We see immense opportunities and possibilities 
within this field. Among the different questions that we posed, we have uh, the following. This can be controlled with our body, but also uh, with a computer brain interface that registers brain activity through thoughts to be able to control the effect in a different place. We had done this in virtual reality bodies, but in this specific project that I'm showing you, this is from an article in 2014 through the brain activity of somebody who was in Rome that was controlling a robot in Japan. If I am controlling with my body, with my thoughts, a robot in Japan, in which way do we feel responsible, accountable for uh, the robot's actions? We launched an experiment experiment where we use different protocols of uh, computer brain interface to be able to control the virtual body. Different uh, tasks had to be executed and just to summarize it, what we saw is that the sense of agency and responsibility of the movement varies depending on the area of the brain that was used. If we were using physiological, sensor, moto activities or visual activities, the feeling was different and the part of the brain activated was different. This illustrates that in this field there's a strong interaction between the study of brains technologies, different technologies, and a very wide array of questions that it would allow us to research different applications that are very important for those who might need them, but also for uh, general use. And that's uh, what I wanted to present. Thank you. Thank you very much. Well, we will now give the floor to Joan, and if we have time, we can open up the conversation. Uh, all yours. Buenas tardes. Well, good afternoon. I'm really happy to be here and have this opportunity to take part in the opening and to present my contribution. I realize I had my first solo exhibition 50 years ago, so I can summarize this in just a few minutes. So I'd like to say how I got to this project where I worked together with another artist, Pilar Rosado, so we are co-authors. The beginning of my work, I was focusing on an interest in three factors, nature, image, and technology. And maybe because of this, the common denominator uh, in the 1970s was photography. I realized photography was a medium that permeated any type of information given by the camera through some values like memory, the truth, the archiving, etc. So I wanted to explore the, the, the causes of these uh, questions why a realistic painting and a photography and a synthesis image and why we would categorize photography as a product of some technology gene genealogy we would um, give it a, a, a quality of truth of a real value of reality so I realized image was a trans translation like a translation I was um, interested in how we translate the experience of knowledge. So this took me gradually to realize that photography was not a um, still element that was a fossil in history, but that it would be dynamic as history would move forward. So this made me think that we're in a different phase that I call post-photography, 
where we still have the body of traditional images, but it has been separated from its values of reality. So we are using photography because of other values, and this has been because, or based on some reasons that are political reasons, economic reasons, cultural reasons, but also technological reasons, obviously. Uh, now, uh, internet, the internet, uh, digital technology, algorithms, automation, robotics are taking the production of images to different horizons, totally different horizons. So there is a project that was the first one where I was using algorithms without knowing it, which is called orogenesis, that started in a vocational way during an art residency in center in Canada. At the art center, they were designing the first algorithms of the 3D rendering, which is the production of virtual landscapes based on cartograph uh, on, on maps. How does it work? In the maps, there are some conventions of colors according to the limits of height. And we just decide that blue is zero. Then green will be 100 meters high. A yellow is a different height. There is a scan that scans this map. And when it finds a um, blue pixel, it gives it a height, a certain height. This way, we translate a horizontal image into a 3D image. These type of programs are used for gaming, but they have a military origin. We have to send uh, soldiers to Afghanistan, and we need to know how is the territory there. So we send these maps to, uh, we put them through these algorithms, and they create a virtual landscape to train the soldiers. So this is the conventional system for which this program has been used. But what happens if we start playing with it? What if we change their its parameters? So we start from maps to get landscapes. But what happens if we lie to the computer and we say that this uh, painting of Friedrich, of the Walker, if we say this is a map, then it produces this landscape this is a crazy landscape so we are forcing the machine we're forcing technology to own the uh, critical paranoid method of Dali or something like this is converting the painting into a landscape this one by French uh, painter we say this is a map interpret it like a map and it renders you this which is totally surrealistic and impressive because this is like a translation that does not fit with the um, design uh, with the will of the designer but it changes the will of the designer this is based on a principle that's uh, based on a critical pedagogy we say that AI needs a deep learning well but this deep learning what what is it worth for? Is it good for controlling us, for watching us, for making us buy some things to vote some candidates? So we have to resist this with some critical thinking. We are at a different technological level. What you have seen was from 1993, 1994. But today, we are in a, a different pace, a very impressive pace. I am sure we don't really understand uh, how this is a revolution. Like one photographer was born in 1839. People would see those photographs. They would say, how a mirror can capture an image. And then you move it, and, and it doesn't move. You move the mirror, and it doesn't move as if the image was caged. People would not understand the process. This that we're seeing now, this is a landscape that does not exist. This has been made by a different program, type of programs, which are text-to-image programs, where you give a description by words, and, the, and then you click and you get this image with programs that are public, of public access, that are free of use, and a anyone can use it. So what's a... Uh, why should we go out and take pictures of landscapes when from uh, 
computer at home, we can get the same result. Once, um, starting there, we have seen uh, many impressive programs. In 2016, there was a Canadian programmer, Jan Fellow, that works for Google, designed the GANG, Generated Adversarial Networks. These are programs of neural networks, antigonic neural networks. Uh, I, I won't go into detail to explain how they work, because I don't have enough time and I really don't understand it completely. I understand what the input is and the output that you get, but the process um, should be explained by my uh, collaborator, Pilar Rosado. Well, this based on a data set, on a file, a repository of images, of a myriad of images, it is able to determine the patterns and predict new images that even an expert cannot separate from the true ones, from the real ones. For example, on the first one, uh, the first project that was prosopagnosia, prosopagnosia, this is a disorder of memory uh, by which you cannot recognize faces. So we got to a file of um, a, um, a newspaper from Asturias, Rejón, that had a collection of uh, portraits of uh, some years ago, uh, just in case they would become news. There was no internet, so if a newspaper would have to speak about Trotsky, when it was killed, he was killed, they would need a picture of Trotsky. So they have this collection of people that could could become uh, news, could be in the news, would be artists, football players, bullfighters, singers, everything, politicians. So we thought that was great. So we scan all these images and we fit them to the computer. And then the algorithm, what, they, what it does is on one side, there is a vector that randomly generates images. It creates combination of pixels just think that any of these images on this grid is 1024 by 1024 pixels, so 1 million pixels. So there's 1 million colors possible for each pixel. So you can imagine uh, how many possible combinations are represented in each of these cells. So on the one hand, there's a generative vector, but at the same time, there is a discriminating vector that compares these results and then uh, compares them against the original images. So as we get closer to the original shapes, the algorithms will keep these, will store these results as the base for the following experiments. So there is a scientific progress by images that progressively get closer to the images on the on the archives. Here we started with uh, uh, colors and structures, but gradually we start to get some results that are that look closer to the original. I'm giving you just some um, just a few images, but this has been done with one of the most powerful computers in Spain, which is the Mare Nostrum, and the progress was doing chup, chup, chup for one month and a half. So each of these images represents a work of maybe weeks of computing. So at the end, we got with this type of results. This type of results, as we can see, are not only images that are realistic, that look like photographs, but they also have the look of these newspapers of the 1930s, 1940s, from this archive of that newspaper. This was this project, this second project that's called Deja Vu, that has to do with the work on iconographic collections of museums. For example, here in, at Fundación Telefónica, we present the work based on all the collection of the Museo del Prado. And this one is from a different museum in France, in Deauville, where they commissioned us to apply the same method. In, in this case, the algorithm, what, what it does in the first place is to determine patterns, to be able to um, separate 
portraits from still natures uh, from landscapes and then it starts to generate images that, uh, that are uh, similar to these images in Deauville there's a um, horse riding center so they have many of these images with horses so eventually this type of process takes us to really uh, to images that you would believe are real and the Van Gogh Museum in Arsenal they have created a fake Van Gogh that has um, has not been spotted by the experts in Van Gogh but the most uh, recognized experts in Van Gogh they, it looked just like a real Van Gogh so this is the goal of the program and what we are interested in, in is game is revolution is to see to what extent up to what point the machine can give us some imagination it is true it has some technology autonomy it has uh, automated uh, mechanisms but do they produce imagination that's our question and in that case uh, we're not looking for a perfect uh, result by the imperfection of the process the imperfection of learning so that all these attempts intermediate attempts that takes us to this um, final result will show us mistakes accidents and unexpected results that uh, from the plastic uh, from a plastic point of view they are great and i believe that in this case the machine technology can get results that w we cannot get with our imagination for example uh, 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 but then the, um as a consolation what i can think is that out of these millions of images the algorithm is not able to tell which ones are the good ones so we need to have a criteria that is able to determine out of this uh, out of this production what's good and what's no good and this maybe should be the the, the role of the artist and we uh, uh, there have been biennial biennial um, festivals that uh, based on algorithm art and the algorithm sometimes they, they 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 have the role to predict what would be the the works that should be bought by uh, by the art center so uh, this way art curators are not necessary necessary anymore so eventually there will only be artists that will be necessary to to say which images should be kept in the collection Thanks. Thank you very much to both of you. I'm afraid we won't have time for the conversation. The exhibition is going to be open for six months. I'm sure we'll have opportunities for other activities. It's been great to see in both your presentations how technology discovers new things on uh, the brains, uh, moves forwards, uh, opens questions, and also what you were explaining, the role of technology and what you said, Mavi, all these applications, the uh, neural rights uh, that are also framed within the exhibition that lead to questions that we couldn't even imagine 10 years ago. The exhibition generates more questions than answers, and we hope that it will inspire everyone. We are delighted to be part of this uh, Cajal year. His figure is a great inspiration. Uh, he's got this uh, hybrid approach as artist, as scientist, his creative and artistic and scientific gaze within his uh, research. We will now move on to the closing uh, ceremony. If you follow us, you know that we always say that exhibitions uh, have to be in the heart of debate, of conversations. 
Um, it is incredible to see the amount of agents and collaborators and for just a few minutes I wanted to thank all those uh, companies that have uh, lent uh, materials, uh, loaners, um, also scientific projects uh, that are mentioned here that are present within the exhibition with all these uh, research groups uh, that have participated. Más de 20 artistas, perdonadme. Um, Artists, uh, counselors, uh, more than a hundred people that have uh, made this possible. Uh, institutions, collaborators, etc. And of course, the team of the CCCB, uh, Jordi, Carlota, the team at the Welcome Collection, uh, Rachel, Emily, and also Maria Renedo and Maria. Um, from the Fundación Telefónica team, the designers, uh, Fernando Muñoz, uh, the team that has uh, led the graphic design and a long, long, etc. We will now give the floor to the Minister for Science and Innovation, Diana Morant, for the closure of this event, and then we will uh, invite you to visit the exhibition. Thank you. Mr. Minister for Universities, Director of the Fundación Telefónica and Director of the CCCB, Curator of the Welcome Collection, General Secretary for Research, General Director of EFICIT, uh, Technical Secretary General of the Science Innovation Ministry, ladies and gentlemen. It is a great pleasure for me to see this space uh, so full of people. Once again, it is an honor for me to participate in the opening of an exhibition brought by Fundación Telefónica, where science and art go hand in hand. Science and art, two allies within the urgent challenge of trying to understand, interpret, and improve the world. Almost a year ago, I was here inaugurating the Connections exhibition that showed how the phone and telecoms uh, implementation transformed society. Once again, we have been fascinated by another project that shows science in a fascinating way. I congratulate you for connecting us to knowledge for contributing towards a more free, innovative, and critical society. This is very much needed in this uh, uncertain world where Democrats are defending basic rights that we thought had been confirmed, rights of women uh, with regard to choosing their own destiny. In this case, Fundación Telefónica invites us to travel to one of the most mysterious realm, realms, brains, that lead to many questions with no answers. Who lives in our brain? Is it uh, an enigmatic architecture that brings forward our personality? It is the house of personality, feelings, uh, memory, and dreams. In a certain way, brains that allow us to think, to reflect, uh, are the network of democracy. This democracy that we have to continue extending and defending. We would have never conceived a war in Europe in 21st century. What if Ramon y Cajal had thought? We owe what we know on the brain to one of the most important Spanish scientists, Cajal, 
the worker of science and hope who was focused on a challenge to modernize the country to positioning it within Europe. A challenge that a century later we defend uh, from the government with our uh, Prime Minister uh, Pedro Sánchez investing in research in science and technology as it has never been done before. We are deploying the new law on innovation and science. It is a brave reform to dignify the working conditions of research staff, translating it into solutions that can uh, benefit the whole of society. Ramon y Cajal is present. He is an inspiration of this exhibition. It is a project that is part of the research year. Ramon y Cajal, thank you for our own and your participation. We have allowed this exhibition to uh, disseminate knowledge on Ramon y Cajal. I want to take this opportunity to encourage other companies, institutions, uh, the general public to join the Cajal year with different activities, uh, collaborations to make this programming more alive that is open to your ideas and that will continue until 2025. The Cajal year, it is the most uh, important supporting project and it is open to different uh, tax incentives with regard to different institutions and companies. With this Cajal year, we will be defending this figure, his legacy uh, as a Nobel Prize winner. We also want to defend Spanish science as a shield of democracy, as an example of progress, uh, to be able to tackle different challenges such as climate emergency. Science saves lives. Science helps us save our planet. And science also generates quality employment. With the Cajal year, we're making visible the scientific research in our country. For instance, in neuroscience, Spain is in position number 11 with regard to scientific production. Half of Spanish articles within this field are published in the most prestigious magazines and 45% more mentions of Spanish articles above world average. We have significant contributions to neuroscience, uh, as you can see in this uh, exhibition, uh, Cerebros. Cerebro is used as a synonym of talent. We need cerebros with uh, soul that explore and imitate the brains of nature, the skills of plants and animals that create collective brains that allow us to move forward to a more inclusive, just and innovative society. Creating bridges, making disruptive technologies such as AI, tools that promote equality and well-being. Our country has to stop uh, the fleeing of people, talented people, trained people to other countries. From the government, we are creating better opportunities for employment uh, to these uh, young researchers who left our country because their country did not uh, help them to be able to retain those who want to stay, to take care of them and to attract the most brilliant minds worldwide. Little by little, we are reaping results. I wanted to share a few data. We have increased by 30% the uh, staff of our public uh, scientific institutions. We have public uh, health care, we have public science in our country, and the one that belongs to 
the state is now launching the largest public employment offerings. Uh, we're reaching out to approximately 4,200 researchers. The second data that I wanted to mention is that since 2000, we have observed a shift in the labor market here in Spain. 2020 was marked by the beginning of the pandemic, but in summer, when we announced that the exit from this crisis was going to be different to the exit uh, from previous uh, crisis. Since we announced a social demo democratic exit with the next generation and um, resilience funds from Europe, we started to create employment in our country because we had future prospects. From that summer, one out of four new jobs created in our country have to do with science and innovation. As you know, it will be the engine of a new sustainable and resilient economy, the future economy. There's no better way to pay tribute to our scientist, Ramon y Cajal, to do our homework, to be proud as to his legacy that uh, took care and loved scientists that uh, praised their work. To end, I would like to go back to Santiago Ramon y Cajal. In his words, there's um, patriotism that is vain, oriented towards the past, but there's another one that is strong, uh, that is focused on the future, between preparing a germ and working with a corpse, who will doubt? Let's create our work with regard to science. Let's protect our democracy by connecting souls with brains as we are doing. Thank you very much. Sí, bueno, damos por terminado el evento en well, in about uh, 10 minutes, you can go to the fourth floor to visit the exhibition. And f for the moment, you can enjoy the cocktail that has been prepared. Thank you.